My name's Harriet. I hack your AI, so the bad guys can't. Hey everyone, welcome back. So the reason that I'm in this strange backlit space today is because I'm in Manchester, UK, which is really exciting. Myself and my colleague Miranda are here for a conference that I can't too, talk too much about, apart from saying that it's an AI security conference and there's AI security people and discussions from all over the world. So it's been a really great week. In our podcast episode about it, if you don't already listen to the podcast episode, you should. We don't really talk about our reflections on the conference per se, but on some of the themes that we've been hearing in the community that, yeah, we've, you know, we thought that here was a good place to talk about. So definitely check out that episode if you haven't already. That's the AI security podcast because no one else claimed that space, so we did. Um... But today I thought, so I'm in the UK for three weeks, so this is not the last time I'll be recording from the UK. And I want to do another episode later on, on some of the regional differences that I'm seeing between, say, Australia, where I'm from, and the UK over here, and the United States. But I thought, in the meantime, I wanted to take you through something a bit more technical, because I haven't done that in a while. And, like, obviously... Um, myself in my life and in my work life we have a lot of research going on and it's not necessarily the kind of research that I think you guys are interested in but maybe I'll be proven wrong but a lot of the research that I'm doing at the moment is in risk analysis and risk quantification because usually when we're going to organizations and we're saying you should care about AI security they're like why show me the dollar figures um, and there's not a lot of that sort of information in the AI security world. So that's the kind of research that I'm doing at the moment. I don't, you know, we're not really in a place where we have exciting outcomes yet. So what I'm going to do today is actually talk through someone else's research. And if you've been in the AI security space for a while, you've probably heard of, I mean, a number of vulnerabilities, but specifically this vulnerability in a pickle file. Um, and so we're going to be talking through some reverse engineering work that reversing labs did into pickle files. First of all, I don't think there's any admin I need to go through. Um, please like, subscribe to this channel. I always feel so weird saying that, but it really helps, especially if, I don't know, Maleva crumbles around me, then at least I still have um, all this sort of community engagement stuff. Please do check out some of the other community building activities that we have going on. So the reason that I wanted to talk through the pickle file exploit today is because this is also something that I talked through in our latest Maleva monthly brief. So as you would probably know, but maybe if you're new here, I run an AI security company called Maleva Security Labs. And we have just started this year doing a monthly brief. I say monthly, but like it takes a lot of work, we're very busy. Um, we have many other things to do, so I'm not sure if it'll continue to be monthly, but it'll at least be maybe every two months. And so we did the first one in February. And so the colleague that I'm here traveling with, Miranda, she's our threat intel lead. And she took us through a bunch of case studies, a bit of a lay of the land of AI security at the moment. And then I took us through a deep dive and that deep dive was pickle. So if you're interested in joining the monthly brief, um, stay tuned to, I don't know, LinkedIn probably is the easiest place to find where I post about that stuff or the website. We also have a fortnightly digest as well, which Miranda um, puts together and it is so much work. And it's the only way that I can stay on top of AI security trends. Uh, there's just so much information out there, but not necessarily enough information about AI security. So I personally find that really valuable. You might too. So again, thank you for being here and thank you for now joining me in the UK. If you can see this object behind me over here, this is actually a hot tub and I'm a sucker for a hot tub. I will, like if there's a hot tub there, I'll be in it every night. And I was so excited. We're staying in this two bedroom apartment here. I was so excited when I saw that thing out there on the deck. However, there's no water in it. So I was really, really, really disappointed. So hopefully um, one of the other locations that I stay in in the UK may have hot tub with water. Um, but anywho, let's get on to the research. Okay, so the first thing to know about pickle files is why they exist in the first place. 
So if we're building a machine learning model, what we've done is we've trained this like model architecture from basically random like weights and variables within the model structure. Um, but we've trained it to optimize on input data so that when it sees new data, it's able to pr pr um, like accurately predict or classify or like generate new text or something. And so when you like save a model, you have to do a process called serialization. And it's basically just a, a line of code that saves that model. So all of the different numbers that make up the computational elements in that model, it basically just saves it in a form that we can retrieve it later. Um, this isn't necessarily trivial. Like it's really important that we like do the correct process because uh, there are so many numbers, it can be really complicated and very, very big. So that's why there are lots of other packages that help us do it. So if you're serializing one of these models, so you're basically saving it so that you can deserialize it later so you can open it. Um, there are lots and lots of different packages that exist depending on the kinds of models that you're using. Um, and I guess depending on the kind of language, but realistically, most of us are using Python, but there's at least, you know, half a dozen. One that I, oh, if you've, if you've done some coding before, you would have seen that TensorFlow and PyTorch have their own uh, libraries to be able to perform this serialization. Another one you might have seen if you're doing like a code read through is this one called HDF5. And so if you see that in code, it's, it's where you are importing the library h5py and, you know, then you just use that in the line of code. And so pickle is another one. You would basically have your line of code that says import pickle and then with something, something, something as the file, pickle dump and then model file path. So pickle is really has been really important in that process and while there were lots of options out there to, to do that save, um, lots of people were using Pickle. However, the problem with Pickle is that if you are deserializing a Pickle file, it can enable arbitrary code execution. What does that mean? If someone has saved malicious code inside that like serialized or saved Pickle file, when you're loading it, when you're deserializing it, that malicious code can run. And this is obviously a bad thing. And this vulnerability or this weakness has been known for a while. And so now Pickle is not considered best practice for saving models. However, you know, there are lots of older models um, or older files, older libraries that may still use Pickle files. And there are also probably a lot of data scientists out there, right, that wouldn't know it's not best practice to use Pickle files. So it definitely still exists. So where would people come across these Pickle files? It's if they're downloading a model from a platform like Hugging Face. So for example, you could go along to Hugging Face and look up all of these different models that you might want to download and import for your own uses to fine tune. And a bunch of them might include pickle files. So fortunately, Hugging Face is aware of this and they have a pickle scanner. So if you're downloading an object, you can run this scan across it and see if there might be a pickle file inside. And if there is, then you can, you know, decide not to download it. You might still decide to download it, but at least you know that it's there. So it doesn't check if that, you know, file within the, the pickle file is malicious. It just checks that there is a pickle file and that there is that risk at least. So this company called Reversing Labs, they do quite a lot of research in cybersecurity. And in this research, they found two models on Hugging Face that contained uh, malicious code, or at least they contained pickle files that were not flagged as unsafe by the pickle scanner. So those two models are stored in PyTorch. Basically the reason that the pickle scan tool wasn't able to pick them up is because it blacklists certain dangerous security features. And as Reversing Labs was looking through these pickle files, they realized that they were broken or if they changed some of the code in a pickle file and it was broken. Also, just to clarify, when I say a broken pickle file, this basically means that you try and run it, but the model doesn't load and you just see an error message. But the, you know, you as a user might not actually know that something has happened behind the scenes, like that malicious code or some code has still run, even though to you it just looks like the file wasn't working and you couldn't load the model that you wanted to. All these pickle files need to end with um, as you can see in the diagram, a, a stop code, which marks the end of the pickle stream. 
So it needs to have this TRX that you can see in the diagram. And they wanted to know if without that, maybe it wouldn't be detected as a pickle file. So they ran a test. What they did was they created a, like a working pickle file and a broken pickle file. And they included some code that you know could be malicious, but obviously because this was research, it wasn't malicious, but they just wanted to see if it would run because if it ran, then it meant that some malicious code could also run. So this particular code that they wanted to test was just the ability to create a text file. You can see in the diagram here that they just decided to put in this code that creates a file called my underscore file dot txt. And they wanted to compare the difference between this working and this broken pickle file in terms of whether it would actually get picked up from the pickle scan tool in Hugging Face. So first they test the working pickle file. They deserialize, they deconstruct the code and they find that the pickle scan tool does actually pick it up. As we can see, there was an alert from the pickle scan tool that this pickle file was um, present and insecure and potentially vulnerability. However, the file was still written to the directory because the, the code, which could have been malicious code, was earlier than what the pickle scan tool was picking up, which was looking for the stop code, which is at the end of the code. So that's a problem. They also decided to run this on the broken pickle file. And in this case, the pickle scan tool did not raise a flag that this was a pickle file or, you know, potentially malicious pickle file and the malicious code also ran. So this is a, a problem, obviously. And Reversing Labs obviously reached out to Hugging Face and Hugging Face um, rectified it really quickly. They were able to add this, you know, edge case into the logic of that tool. I think this is a really interesting piece of research because I've been hearing about pickle files and vulnerabilities from an AI machine learning sense for a while. And I know that, you know, depending on where you look, there there is definitely people who are talking about it and why. But I also wanted to talk about it here because this is a really interesting example of you know, that sort of blurred line between an AI security problem and a traditional cybersecurity problem, but the, you know, potential lack of dialogue between the different AI and security parties means that these kinds of incidents go unnoticed. So that's why it's really important that as, you know, data scientists or AI people, we're more aware of the security implications, you know, where aware that pickle files can be vulnerable or, or weak and that security folk are finding ways to tell data scientists and AI people and developers that this is a problem and also that there's a good community of practice around it. Also in the article, Reversing Labs goes into, um, I'm not sure if it's salesy, I think this might be their tool, but they sort of go into different policies that they recommend organizations have in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening. I'll include the image here. They include a number of policies designed to detect such specific, sorry, such suspicious activities, including serialized data in pickle files that can execute code, create new processes and establish networking capabilities. So, you know, depending on what kind of role you're in, there are obviously things that organizations need to put into practice when it comes to their policies. And, Hugging Face, you know, has a challenge here because they know that pickle files can can do this. They know that they can arbitrarily execute code. And so they have three things that can do, right? They can either ban the pickle files, they can do nothing, or they can find this middle ground, which is what they've decided to do with their pickle scan tool, which is like, it's a, it's a challenging thing, right? And so the Reversing Labs team ends with sort of a conclusion. They've listed these specific malicious hugging face model files, the ones that they were looking at. Um, and they also go through the IP addresses. This is a good example of indicators of compromise, which is a more cyber security flavored term. And so just to, just to summarize what we did here. So basically the researchers found that there were models in Hugging Face that had pickle files that weren't being detected by pickle scan. They wanted to test why a particular pickle file might not be detected and whether it could still arbitrary, arbitrarily execute code. So they created a working pickle file and a broken pickle file. The reason it broke was because they changed some of the code in it um, so that it wouldn't like run properly. They basically just deleted a character they put some 
code they wanted to execute in each of those files. It wasn't malicious, but it was a proxy for malicious files. And they ran those pickle files to see if the code would be executed, which it was. It wrote a file to the directory and whether the pickle scan tool would pick it up, which in the case of the broken pickle scan file, um, which in the case of the broken pickle file, it didn't. So this is an interesting, this is an interesting piece of research. You could even say that the researchers were in a bit of a pickle. OCBEs, or Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, are unique identifiers assigned to publicly known cybersecurity vulnerabilities in software or hardware. For example, this pickle vulnerability would have a CVE number. So they're maintained by the MITRE Corporation and they're published in what's called the National Vulnerability Database, or the NVD, and they're basically a universal reference point for researchers, vendors, security teams to track and remediate these security flaws. They're usually discovered and reported by security researchers, vendors, coordinated disclosure programs like HackerOne or BugCrowd. Once a vulnerability is verified, it's assigned a CVE ID and a description, which helps organizations quickly share and act on consistent information about the issue. For example, I'm showing all the CVEs that we've tracked for AI over the last week alone. When it comes to AI and CVEs, the current landscape is really still emerging. Most CVEs affecting AI systems are cyber vulnerabilities in the underlying infrastructure of AI products, such as insecure APIs, exposed model endpoints, or flaws in dependencies like Python libraries or machine learning frameworks. These are traditional security issues within AI-enabled applications rather than vulnerabilities specific to how AI itself functions. What's really missing is a formal standardized way to document AI-native vulnerabilities, things like adversarial attacks, model inversion, data poisoning, or prompt injection. MITRE now had a, has a database that can log these, um, which is definitely a step in the right direction. Those threats don't usually fall within the scope of existing CV definitions, which means that AI-specific risks do often remain invisible in current vulnerability tracking systems. There's also a gap in, in that while obviously a company like Reversing Labs is doing really good work here, and there are definitely more people contributing to the sort of vulnerability research space in AI, there are still not nearly as much as there should be. And there is definitely a lot more out there that hasn't been found yet. So I encourage you as the viewers to um, potentially go and find them. Well, I think we're at time today. <laughs> we have um, one more day of the conference today. So I think I'm gonna go in there. I hope all of you have a really, yeah, great day and I'll see you next time.